experts, things like that. Uh, so you'll uh, be seeing um, sewage systems, water systems, um, uh, uh, in internet systems all being compromised as a result of a road um, uh, being damaged. There's also um, greater population and uh, reduction in public spending, all contributing to the challenge for municipal staff to uh, try and keep all these assets maintained in, in good working order. So in, uh, in Canada, the engineers of Canada have done a lot of work on uh, climate change, and they concluded that climate-related risks are aggravated by this frequent co-location and interdependency of municipal infrastructure systems and that municipal infrastructure is often like a web of interwoven strands. When one starts to fray, then there's a potential for complex failures uh, around surrounding infrastructure. And so what we want to explore today is, is uh, how that works uh, and how you can um, adapt by, uh, through planning and design, um, putting in redundancy um, into, and keeping up with operations and maintenance. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that today. Next slide. So some specific factors to consider. Uh, we are seeing extreme rain and flooding events more often. We are seeing hotter and drier summers. Uh, we're seeing accelerated uh, freeze and thaw cycles, uh, greater snow and ice variability. Um, we're seeing problems stemming from increased use of, of salt, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, there are some very severe consequences in, uh, in more remote communities that we'll talk about as well. The US Midwestern uh, Regional Climate Center uh, offers phosphorese maps, uh, as well as what they call the climate tool, um, where you can access climate data and other value-added tools. So those in the States might want to take advantage of that. Um, the MRCC also has helpful resources uh, for forecasting vegetation and crop impacts, weather maps, and other, and other useful resources. And the U.S. National Weather Service uh, Climate Prediction Center also offers weather maps, uh, drought and flooding information, information for severe storm tracking and readiness planning. And the Climate Prediction Center also offers climate outlooks that are customized to specific time frames. Um, there's also a Great Lakes Hydro Climate Dashboard that provides water level information, um, that provides uh, monthly level forecasts, but also decade-long weather trends uh, and historic uh, reconstructions as well. All those um, links are, uh, are in the uh, presentation, so you can uh, find those resources fairly easily. Next slide. So this is a, now a a famous uh, picture of a uh, GO interurban uh, train that was um, uh, stuck in very, uh, very high waters uh, after a flood. I believe it was in 2013. Um, and this is the kind of interruption uh, that can occur. Um, so climate-related disruptions in transportation infrastructure are uh, obviously often related to uh, greater frequency and intensity of these extreme rain events uh, that then result in this kind of flooding. Uh, and more frequent and intense extreme rain and flooding events has the capacity to cause significant uh, drainage issues and erosion to roads and, and bridge structures. It also lends to uh, increasingly overwhelming uh, culverts. Causeways, bridges, roadways, particularly low-lying ones, are also vulnerable to washouts or inundation as a result of uh, more frequent and more intense rainstorms. And the result um, is overflow from streams and water bodies. So an increase in extreme rain and flooding events also causes risks for the joint expansion of pavement and uh, bridge infrastructure and asphalt softening. And that's where you get um, uh, these potholes that are, uh, that are popping up more, more frequently now. Added precipitation also increases soil moisture, which lends to slope instability and landslides, landslides, which can damage or close roads and bridges, and high winds and high channel flows associated with extreme rain and, and flooding events can compromise the integrity of, of bridge infrastructure. Next slide. So the flip 
side, the, of the extremes of climate change are that uh, sometimes we're dealing with flooding, sometimes we're dealing with uh, hotter and drier summers, and we'll see that increasingly in future years. Uh, and the increase in the number and severity of hot days will have impacts like uh, an increase in pavement softening, the distortion of pavement in wheel paths uh, during extreme heat events. And this can require, you know, at times that municipalities have to reduce maximum loads or transport vehicles on paved surfaces for, for certain routes. Extreme heat events also promote uh, traffic-related rutting, uh, flushing or bleeding to old and poorly constructed paved surfaces. Pavement rutting, flushing and bleeding, of course, affects the functional performance of pavement and presents implications for, for safety and maintenance costs. So overall, you may see a shorter lifespan uh, for roads, rails, and bridges and culverts as a result of uh, hotter and drier summers. Next slide. And then the Great Lakes uh, also enjoys uh, the extremes of winter. Uh, and the resulting warmer temperatures uh, result in greater frequency of, of the freeze-thaw cycle uh, during the winter months uh, in some of the Great Lakes region. Uh, though it has to be said that in other regions there's actually been a reduction in these cycles. It depends where you are. Accelerated freeze-thaw cycles uh, contribute to the rapid deterioration and instability of paved surfaces, ditches, culverts, drains, ramps, bridges, and tunnels as water within these structures expand and contract with the temperature fluctuations. And this results in an increase in the frequency and intensity of bleeding, the upward shift of asphalt to pavement surface, the cracking and rutting of paved surfaces, and more rapid road surface and structural deterioration. And this occurrence increases the potential for maintenance, required maintenance, rehabilitation, and, and reconstruction of paved structures earlier uh, than anticipated in their design life. Next slide. And so as a result, you know, the use of road salt becomes uh, very important. It always is important um, because it's one of the most effective and affordable ways to make roads safe to drive. Um, cold weather states in the United States use about 10 to 15 million tons of road salt every year. Um, so road saf safety uh, is paramount, but it does have to be balanced with um, injury to the environment and to infrastructure. Uh, road salt degrades the surrounding natural environment, causing damage to vegetation, uh, street trees, birds and wildlife, uh, freshwater fish, and sometimes even drinking water. It's the chloride in road salt that's toxic to aquatic vegetation and wildlife soils, groundwater, uh, rivers, and lakes. Uh, and anti-caking agents and salt sometimes contain cyanide, which, of course, the EPA has classed as a toxic pollutant. Um, and, you know, the security of private wells uh, can be at risk of salt contamination. Uh, concrete infrastructure, bridges, railway cross and crossings can all uh, c be corroded by salt. Uh, and excess salt can actually accumulate uh, and cause traffic signal box malfunctions uh, and contribute to roadway congestion and even accidents. Road salt spray in high traffic areas can get into in electrical equipment and, and cause shortages. Um, so even though there's a projected reduction in average snowpack, um, which will reduce overall snow removal costs for municipalities, um, unusual extremes may actually result in more use of salt, uh, at least in uh, the coming years. Next slide. So that creates a dilemma for municipalities, because um, on the one hand, in 2003, there was a, uh, a case in Ontario where uh, an individual lost control of her vehicle on an icy road and traveled into oncoming traffic and collided with another vehicle uh, after there had been two centimeters of snow that had fallen. And the courts found um, that municipal authorities had been lax in their roadway monitoring and clearing duties and that the municipality was not in compliance with the minimum maintenance standards in in Ontario as they relate to icy roadways and snow accumulation. And then in just last year, a Lambton County farmer was awarded more than $100,000 in damages in uh, a potentially precedent-setting lawsuit involving a municipal government's use of road salt. So the municipality is doing the right thing to keep the, uh, the road safe and uh, 
the farmer claimed and won the suit that the farm had suffered crop losses leading to a depreciation in value of their farm as a result of that road salt use. So uh, looking at um, road salt use and how to uh, apply it as efficiently as possible or how to use different um, uh, uh, different uh, brines or sand as an alternative um, may be something that your municipality is already looking at. Next slide. There's also, of course, a link uh, between road safety and uh, the impact of climate change and public health. The U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that 70% of automobile accidents resulting in death are snow or ice related. Driving conditions and severe weather can be extremely perilous. Um, evidence from climate models suggests that an increase in overall severe storm and weather events uh, is, is likely. So uh, this will result in uh, visibility impairments due to precipitation and high winds, uh, temperature extremes that may affect drivers' uh, capabilities or even the vehicle performance, uh, pavement friction, roadway infrastructure, potential lane obstructions, uh, crash risk, or just overall traffic flow. Um, so there are ways um, to make uh, motor transportation more resilient, uh, uh, conducting infrastructure vulnerability assessments, as we'll hear from uh, Vesna in a moment, uh, ensuring that all new construction is planned and designed in accordance with the latest re research on resilient transportation, and taking a systems view. And by that, we, need, we mean that transportation networks are more than a, the sum of their individual parts. Some elements of uh, the system are particularly important. Uh, could be because of their vital economic role. Um, there could be an absence of alternatives. Uh, there could be uh, heavy use of, in a certain area. So it's trying to figure out uh, where the most critical areas are of your system um, and uh, possibly building in redundancy where it's needed. Okay, next slide. We wanted to touch on the impact uh, on transportation systems and climate change in more remote communities, not necessarily just smaller communities, but the ones that are more remote. Wawa, Ontario uh, is in northern Ontario uh, and uh, quite a distance from uh, any large community. Um, and then in 2012, they had um, rainfall uh, of about four inches or 100 millimeters. Uh, over the space of 12 hours. And uh, you can see the, the devastating effect on uh, bridges and uh, roadways. That roadway is one of the two main highways that lead in and out of the town of, of just over 2,000 people. Um, both of the highways failed, so they didn't have transportation in or out for at least, I think, a week or so. Um, and also, uh, three bridges um, uh, were damaged and one culvert collapsed. Um, so it's a question of, you know, what do you do in a situation where you are um, completely cut off and, and in fact, Wawa uh, responded very quickly and repaired the, uh, the essential uh, roadways as quickly as possible. Next slide. Do I have next slide, please? There's also impact to railway uh, networks, and even if the municipality isn't responsible for railways, the connectivity to your own transportation systems is, is relevant. And climate affects railroad systems and operations, efficiency, scheduling, and demand. And the viability of railway transit uh, impacts uh, many passengers, but also businesses, um, uh, because of the cargo that's being uh, delivered. Uh, so it, a disruption of the railway network can be uh, disruptive in many ways. Um, railway tracks can buckle in extreme temperature, causing um, derailments, as you can see in this picture. Uh, crossings and bridges are particularly vulnerable. And severe weather may require just sudden stops or rerouting of uh, a common train route. High-speed uh, crosswinds can be particularly hazardous for train operators and travelers, and uh, hazardous cargo, obviously, uh, is at risk if a train derails. So some of the adaptation uh, strategies could include increased forecasting capability with real-time data and additional monitoring stations, um, identify high-risk earthworks or flood sites, extreme temperature and, and high wind zones and aging infrastructure. Uh, you may, you know, if you're on the coast, raise seawalls, uh, increase your drainage capacity, uh, increase vegetation, 
around the rails. Uh, Network Rail in the UK has developed some interesting and useful adaptation plans for its uh, extensive railways uh, throughout the country. The company installed 102 new weather monitoring stations along the Scotland train route to improve uh, its capability to receive weather forecasts and alerts. Next slide. And again, you are not responsible for air travel, but air travel does impact your municipality. Uh, extreme weather can lead to the grounding of flights. Uh, runway and aircraft damage can occur uh, with extreme temperatures and excessive precipitation. Uh, increased business costs uh, can result. Um, sudden or gradual changes in demand can occur if you're uh, having these troubles on a regular basis. And you'll just have unhappy customers. Um, so adaptation strategies can include infrastructure reinforcements, again, like seawalls if you're in a coastal area, uh, diversified local supplies or resources. If you have to get fuel to the airport, it may be a good idea to have um, a bit of redundancy built into that system. Uh, stormwater improvements uh, to improve drainage, uh, enhanced response programs for disruptions and emergency management plans. And then there's the uh, question of public transit that many of you are responsible for. Um, climate conditions pose a threat to transit operators and drivers as well as passengers. Uh, emergency vehicle operators are particularly at risk and, and uh, vital emergency services may slow or stop completely. Um, and increased precipitation can flood um, bus and train storage lots and power outages can disrupt traffic control signals for all types of transit. Um, subways and below grade Transportation uh, are especially prone uh, to a risk of flooding, and you can see in this uh, in this photograph, uh, I believe this is in New York City, I may be wrong. Low-income populations, seniors, disabled citizens who may be more reliant on public transportation are, are obviously more affected. Um, adaptation strategies, sealing uh, street-level vents and manholes, protecting uh, underground pump rooms, circuit breaker houses, and other underground facilities that provide power to subways. Uh, purchasing buses or ferries that are able to withstand adverse weather conditions and upgrading emergency uh, communication systems. In New York in uh, 2010, record snowfall stranded city buses and flooding in 2007 shut down 19 major segments of the bus system, uh, affecting 2 million customers. Hurricane Katrina's uh, storm surge flooded bus terminals and deposited debris and devastated public transit agencies uh, and operations. New York has just been uh, allocated $3.6 in federal disaster relief funds uh, to help rebuild and harden its public transit system against climate change. So it will be interesting to see how they go about that. Next slide. Many of you have um, ports and harbors that are important to your local economy, uh, and there are climate change risks to uh, those as well. 80% uh, of the world's volume and trade is carried by sea, uh, and as harbors and docks become more vulnerable to rising coastal water levels or, and storm surges or in the Great Lakes uh, situation, lower lake levels, uh, you're going to be seeing an impact um, in uh, maritime shipping. Combined with the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Mississippi River, the Great Lakes are the mid-continent's trade link to markets around the world, handling about 180 metric tons of cargo per year at a value of about $35 billion and employing over 200,000 people. Uh, so you can see that this is an area that uh, even if your municipality isn't directly responsible for ports and harbors, you may uh, have an interest in it. Next slide. And uh, in terms of uh, climate change, uh, in terms of the U.S. energy infrastructure uh, assessment that the National Research Council has undertaken, um, it says that, uh, that our infrastructure is particularly prone to severe weather, blackouts, and water shortages. Those are the three areas. When assessing, forecasting, uh, and responding to potential impacts of climate change and weather, uh, on the energy sector, you must consider uh, lower probability, higher impact scenarios. Um, so they may not occur very often, but their impact is very high. 
and those are considered tipping points beyond which there are irreversible changes or changes of higher magnitude that it, um, than expected based on previous experience. So air traffic control hubs, for example, uh, very important, probably not affected very often, but when they are, uh, very big impacts. Next slide. Specifically turning to the electricity sector, energy supplies and usage um, can be affected by climate change. The U.S. electricity grid is uh, huge, complex, consists of more than uh, 9,200 electric generating units uh, with more than 1,000 gigawatts of generating capacity connected to more than 300,000 miles of transportation lines. And increasing temperatures are expected to increase demand while also increasing transmission losses reducing uh, current carrying capacity, increasing stresses on the distribution system, and decreasing substation efficiency and lifespan. In terms of infrastructure impacts from climate change, there's a stress on the power grid due to more summer heat waves, uh, increased annual energy costs due to uh, probable need for more air conditioning and cooling during the summer, a demand from air conditioning uh, from residential units, uh, increased vehicle fleet replacement and maintenance costs, uh, damage to key infrastructure like electrical distribution equipment, uh, and increased wear on buildings uh, due to heat and weather uh, extremes. Increasing temperatures can also cause sag of uh, overhead transmission lines due to uh, thermal expansion creating a safety hazard. Um, and more frequent and intense heat waves uh, is already bringing uh, electricity transmission and distribution systems uh, that are carrying less current and uh, operate less efficiently as the ambient air temperature is higher. Next slide. This gives you a sense of um, how increasing intensity of storm events increases the risk of damage to electric transmission and distribution lines. Since 2000, there has been a steady increase in the number of storm-related grid distribution uh, disruptions in the U.S., and these disruptions can result in high costs for utilities and consumers, including repair costs for damaged equipment, such as transmission and distribution systems, and societal costs in terms of work interruptions and lost productivity. Strong winds associated with severe storms, including tropical storms and hurricanes, can be particularly damaging to energy uh, infrastructure. And heavy snowfall and storms, snowstorms uh, have increased the frequency in the Northeast and Upper Midwest and decreased in frequency in the South and Southern Midwest, can also damage and disrupt electricity transmission. Next slide. OK, let's just go to the next slide. So just quickly returning to this question of adaptation and mitigation, uh, a lot of municipalities are embracing the idea of alternative transit modes with more, um, with more cycling and uh, walkability within their communities. Uh, and obviously, there's uh, more use of electric vehicles. I think California is leading in this regard. Um, so all these things make a difference in terms of how to reduce uh, the emissions from transportation. Next slide. This is a somewhat detailed infographic, but what it shows is um, some of the impacts uh, of climate change on the energy sector, reduced power plant operations, plant cooling, fuel transportation vulnerabilities, uh, and even changes to climate cycles that impact renewable energy generation and production. In terms of mitigation, there's some strategies that have been adopted around the Great Lakes. Um, Ontario has phased out coal-generated electricity and has a feed-in tariff to encourage renewables. Um, some jurisdictions have implemented negative emissions technologies uh, and are providing rebates for energy retrofits. What's interesting in a ranking of the top 10 energy efficient states uh, in the United States, only two were uh, from the Great Lakes region. Massachusetts ranked first. Uh, California and New York State came in second and third, and congratulations to those in Illinois uh, who rounded out the top ten, but only two out of the eight. Next slide. 
There's also a lot that municipalities can do in terms of their own building code, but also at the provincial and state level. Uh, of the role of building code is important in being able to reduce the impacts of climate change. Next slide. And obviously the uh, routine maintenance of energy and transportation infrastructure is one of the easiest and most cost-effective strategies for dealing with uh, impacts uh, of changing climate. Uh, establishing a schedule for reviewing uh, ingress and egress patterns and identify uh, highest priority repairs needed, um, identifying those high-risk um, areas for flooding and installing warning signals and conducting uh, emergency drills uh, and uh, being very careful about revising plowing guidelines and emergency routes will all, will all help. Next slide. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, David and Vesna, who uh, are both from the City of Toronto but have different um, responsibilities there. David's going to talk about uh, some work he's done with the electricity sector, and Vesna will uh, talk about some work uh, with transportation services in, on, in Toronto. David? Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Uh, so I've got 15 minutes to uh, tell you some things that you won't find in books or the internet. It's uh, based on the School of Hard Knocks and I've worked with the, on the issue of adaptation for the last eight years. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about towards extreme, extreme weather resilience uh, working with the electrical sector. And uh, I open out with this slide because I want you to imagine that 15 years ago if you were in a little zodiac you'd be in about a kilometer of ice and that's only a, uh, uh, 15 years ago. And uh, I open with this slide because it's a good icebreaker for the audience. So uh, looking at the outline of uh, my talk today, I want to give you a little bit about the context of the situation uh, that we have in, in Toronto with the electrical sector and, and climate. Uh, I want to talk about the strategy that, uh, that we use to engage the electrical sector, uh, some of the actions to assist the electrical sector, and then some of the next steps. So really quickly, uh, we had to spend uh, $250,000 of hard-earned taxpayer money to uh, get some more detailed climate information. Don't want to dwell on this, but it, it was uh, a useful exercise uh, to actually make this available to the electrical sector because it, it put a point on, on what we're looking at uh, for the future. So our infrastructure is built on the assumption of a stable climate, but it, it's not, right? So. The engineering of it uh, means that it goes past certain thresholds and, and gets into trouble. Uh, so some of the drivers for adaptation that, that we see, and this is kind of our priority listing, is safety to avoid, avoid harm to the public and employees, uh, customer service, uh, maintaining prosperity and achieving cost avoidance. So looking at damages to infrastructure from extreme weather, considering our credit and insurance risk rating and our business and reputation, uh, reputation uh, wanting to attract and retain uh, businesses and employment, and uh, also achieving efficiency through cooperation, especially recognizing interdependencies of infrastructure. I'll have a little bit more on that concept of interdependency. And then uh, also just considering overall, uh, there can be corporate and personal legal liability when there's a failure to act. So uh, looking at just quickly some of the history, uh, Toronto was one of the first cities in the world, actually, to have a climate change adaptation strategy. And uh, at that point, I said to myself, you know what, if I, if I did a perfect job and the city of Toronto was fully uh, resilient to climate change, we'd only be 50% done. Because what about all of the uh, other businesses and infrastructure, as well as our residents? So uh, we brought together a forum on infrastructure and climate change adaptation that involved about 120 people from about 100 different uh, organizations, and we decided that uh, it would be quite relevant to have some type of kind of multi-sectoral group, which in 2011 we formed as, a, as the WeatherWise Partnership, which I'll tell you a bit more later. Uh, in the period of 2010 to 2012, we did that climate modeling. We developed the uh, climate change risk assessment tool, which Ben will tell you about. And also we did some benchmarking around the world uh, to some of the other cities that were working hard on climate adaptation. So uh, 
talking about this concept of dependency. Yeah, municipalities don't control all the infrastructure, but we depend on it. Um, if I had time, I could go on for about uh, two hours on a six-month project. We have developed diagrams of all of the core functions of our city and all of the infrastructure and services that it depends upon. And uh, so that those 50 diagrams uh, were developed uh, to help us understand the, that dependency. Our next step is to get that uh, built into a, into a GIS, Geographical Information System. So uh, looking at this WeatherWise partnership, uh, the purpose of that was to manage risks of extreme weather impacts on critical infrastructure and services. So our membership, uh, you can see there, there were more than 50 organizations across Toronto, including banking, insurance, and I've got electricity highlighted because I'm going to be talking about that one. And so there's lots of different sectors that were involved. And we got this idea from doing the benchmarking and looking at what London was doing, New York. And uh, incidentally, Barcelona has a conference coming up very shortly. And uh, for those that can afford to go over there, uh, it's going to be talking about their multi-sectoral approach, um, which I think is one of the leading examples in the world. Um, in the WeatherWise partnership, uh, we uh, had a democratic approach, and we provided uh, a briefing on what about six different sectors we're doing, and then we had a vote. Uh, so we've got here, if you can imagine, uh, representatives from 50 major organizations collectively representing hundreds of billions of dollars of built assets and economic activity, and they're voting. And so, uh, so I'm there, I'm saying, okay, what's the priority? Is it our transportation system? Is it food? Is it telecom? Is it means to pay for things during a power outage? Um, is it, uh, is it our buildings, or is it our electrical system? And the hand shot up, and it was almost unanimous. So why is the business uh, sector so concerned about the electrical sector? And that is that energy costs are important to the business competitiveness, but business and critical infrastructure owners are seeking an investment climate where energy supply is reliable and, and secure. So it was very clear that at that point, actually half my job instantly became working with the electrical sector. It could have been any other sector, but it happened to be electrical. So I proceeded uh, in the context of an emerging energy crunch in the city with population growth, more high rises, aging distribution system, crippled, capped electrical supply of, of electricity coming in, uh, more frequent extreme weather with peak demand and stresses and damage to infrastructure. So it's a bit of a challenge. So uh, the approach that developed over the ensuing year or so uh, was um, we wanted to demonstrate the concern of key customers. We did that through the voting, and that allowed me to approach, literally, knock on doors of uh, executives in six different electrical organizations. And we were working on a benchmarking study, and I was able to prove to them that other electrical jurisdictions around the world were taking work on adaptation action. Uh, so we established the support for an electrical business case, which I'm going to show you some maps and stuff about that later. Uh, understanding major stakeholders' tolerance to power disruption, we did a survey, which I'll show you quickly. We assessed the potential impact of a, a representative sample on the electrical system of weather doing a PIVC risk assessment, which I'll tell you about. And then, then the next step is to identify where additional risk reduction actions are required. Okay, so this, we did this survey. Uh, we had to raise $60,000 to do it. It was very professionally done. Uh, and essentially, the bottom line at the bo very bottom was that there's a strong indication of a lack of tolerance by critical infrastructure providers and critical services like food supply, um, like police, fire, ambulance, uh, not a good tolerance to an extended power disruption. So that gives us some evidence that there is a problem. So we, we speculated back in 2012 that there was a problem. So I just want to quickly show you some stuff here. Particular vulnerability for Toronto is that we have a unique situation of lots of high-rise buildings with the associated problems you can see with power disruption. So this is a map that we devised, uh, that some other staff devised, to look at, at where the vulnerable people live. And then we thought, well, where are most of the power disruptions occurring that we have record of? And then we simply did an overlay. And this was really quite instructive. And it gave more specific risk information that we could provide to the, to the electrical regulator um, 
which happens to be in Ontario, the Ontario Energy Board. So this helped develop the business case, and this is how the City of Toronto staff uh, recognized that we could be allied with the electrical sector in working together to achieve understanding of climate risk and to achieve obtaining the necessary funds to actually adapt. And that could only be done if the regulator gives the money for that to be done. So this is uh, real quickly encapsulates what we call the climate change engineering vulnerability assessment. Uh, we've done phase one already with Toronto Hydro and we use what's called the PIVC protocol. And that stands for Public Infrastructure Engineering Vulnerability Committee. I'm on that national committee. And you can see that, I mean, if you want, all you have to do is, I've got a link at the very bottom, and you can go and see the case study, what was done. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, the second phase is in progress, and that's for the whole system and looking for future climate impacts and that will be used as evidence to help justify um, spending money on adaptation. So this is very practical stuff. So what are some of the lessons learned? Well, I had to in, un, undertake some education of electrical customers that were very important. We had a voting process that allowed us to exert, well, frankly, some pressure on the electrical sector to say, hey, we got some important customers of yours that are worried. Um, Multi-sectoral coordination was very time-consuming, uh, but we think that it was helpful uh, in that the private sector helped us sustain some momentum during a, a four-year period where there was not as much political support for our work. Um, so I would also say that there is a need for ongoing staff facilitation of this multi-sectoral group because when we had uh, reductions in staff levels, we had reductions in effort available to help run this group. So we had some lessons learned from the 2013 storms. Yeah, we were right. The electrical system was vulnerable. I got knocked out significantly in the 2013 storms. So a big theme that came out of that is a need to enhance communication systems, a need to track and, and look after both vulnerable people better. We know that trees on wires and flooding are a key vulnerability. And we know in the future that demand due to air conditioning will be a, a problem. Uh, so with respect to next steps, uh, this may interest the group. We held a vote in 2012 and said, well, other than the electrical sector, what are the priorities? And you can see what they are right there. So Vesna is going to tell you what we have done in transportation. And I'm happy to let you know that, that I'm making some inroads in the telecom uh, sector. Uh, next slide here is just a quick concept here of some of the GIS work that we're trying to do. Um, that purple area that just appeared is hypothetically the area served by this transformer. The other blue circles are stream crossings. And this area that's pointed out by the black arrow, I think anyone in Ontario should care about, because that's the Ontario Food Terminal. So this is a simple overlay concept of GIS that we're going to be using. But uh, we will be getting into more complex uh, considerations that, that Vesna is working on, uh, taking it to the next level with the University of Waterloo. Um, so just to sum up in the next couple slides, uh, we're working towards the culture of climate change risk management, balancing priorities between public and employee safety, engaging other sectors and the public on resilience to extreme weather associated with climate change while balancing fiscal responsibility, liability, and then thinking about not only our current but also future needs. Um, I'm happy to say, and I got this just an hour ago, that, uh, and I asked the Canadian Electricity Association if they could provide a statement and essentially, they're, they're kind of picking up uh, sort of the next steps. And I'm, I, I think I could say that the work that we did in Toronto helped lay some of the groundwork um, that the Canadian Electricity Association could be doing nationally. And so the essential statement is that, um, is that the Canadian Electricity Association's sustainable electricity program has an indicator on whether members have an adaptation management plan in place. And so what they're trying to do is have everybody have climate change adaptation management plans by 2020 if they're going to be a member of the CEA uh, in Canada. So the CEA is currently working on a template to provide consistency and guidance for members as they develop internal plans and strategies. And I, there's an additional note from my colleague uh, Todd Hall, who was with me right from the start on this, and that is that there are many 
utilities out there like Durham Region and City of Toronto that are already identifying their vulnerabilities and assessing their risk. And that's my last slide, and I'm done. Thanks. So now okay, it I'm gonna I'm gonna start while well, you get ready with my slide. I'm gonna start the presentation, uh, just uh, giving a little bit of uh, backgrounder. Um, in the cognizance of time. So thank you again for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, webinar so I could talk about some of the work that we did in transportation. Uh, what the slide shows uh, a title called Beyond the Storm. What do we mean beyond the storm? Well, beyond the storm means a paradigm shift in how planners, engineers plan design for the future. And how do we do this? Well, Toronto has developed a risk based process and tool that enables infrastructure managers to better understand and manage climate change risk. Today's focus is not only on extreme storms and their devastating impacts, but the gradual and systematic impacts of the changing climate on infrastructure and operations and how Toronto is dealing with these things. Now, just as a backgrounder, the division is responsible about 5,500 kilometers of roads, 530 bridges, 154 culverts, 22 traffic signals, et cetera. We have 1,200 experienced staff, and the replacement of these assets is about $12.1 million. Next slide. Billion dollars, sorry. $12.1 billion. So this slide here, as I always ask people, is, is this Louisiana or Toronto? Well, funding is only a small component of the impacts that we've seen over the last 10 years. Next slide. Both of the previous presenters, next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Both of the previous presenters have given us a quick, a very good overview of the drivers and challenges. The one thing I'm just going to add is that many people do not look at the issue of procurement and contracting practices, such as an overemphasis on initial capital costs without proper consideration of operations and maintenance issues can increase our vulnerabilities. Any organization that outsources their activities needs to require resiliency from any of their third parties. In addition, disruption of operations and emergency response capability due to cascading failures and back-to-back -back events needs to be addressed. Next slide. When we talk about the term resiliency, I'm always, uh, a colleague of mine gave me a quote that really addresses this issue. Socrates stated, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. And often we need to understand what we mean by resiliency. When we see this slide, we see adaptation is to mitigate the impacts from materializing. While often there is confusion that emergency response is also gives us a path to resiliency, but that is what happens after the impact. And we respond to, recover from, and mitigate the impact of that disaster. Next slide. What we're going to focus on when we look at resiliency, we do look at mitigation. We need to look at emergency preparedness. But what we truly need to focus on, and this is the, the body of the work that we're, I'm going to talk about, is the adaptation wheel. Next slide. I was listening to Nicola's presentation, and I just added this. I think that one of the key things that she identified is a systematic approach, and I can't stress that enough. We have a good understanding of all our failures, of all the munici uh, in our municipal system. The list is endless. But what do we do with this information? How do we manage the quantity of impacts and the competing issues? Where do we invest our limited dollars? And this is a key issue for municipal managers. And what I'm suggesting is that the City of Toronto's tool gives you that capability. It's a tool that is a simple four-pronged step and is in, uh, based on Microsoft Access, and as well as you are, uh, with that you get a user and technical manual. This tool is designed to handle climate, environment, and health and safety risks. It has a large uh, data capacity, and most importantly, it's evidence of or record of due diligence. Next slide. I'm going to go take a few minutes 
to go over very quickly over uh, the, the capability of the tool. As I indicated before, it's a four-step process. It was modeled on the inter an International Risk Management Standard, ISO 3100, as well as aligned with the International Environment Management Standard of ISO 14001. So the four steps are to establish the context, to identify the risk, to analyze the risk, and then to treat the risk. Next slide. In terms of establishing the context, we need to do the external, uh, external, and internal, as well as identifying the uh, scope, which is identifying the high priority assets and critical services. And then you establish the risk criteria, which is the time horizon, consequence categories, likelihood rating, and the risk tolerance definition. Next slide. With respect to identifying the risk, we identify the source of the risk. You identify the current vulnerabilities and existing controls were extremely important because you will find as you undertake this exercise is that you are going to actually document your current due diligence. And then you identify the what if risk scenarios, which is a combination of risk source, the M impact, and the vulnerabilities that could create this risk despite existing controls. Next slide. With respect to the risk analysis, you uh, establish the magnitude and severity of consequences. You estimate the likelihood of occurrence, and then you determine the risk rating. Next slide, please. One of the first things we uh, developed is the a definition of the various consequences. So we have six different consequences, uh, people, uh, logistics, environment, cost, time, etc. And we have a rating across six levels, ranging from insignificant to catastrophic. Next slide. This is a sample of some of the definitions. The key part about this is that it needs to be a systematic approach, identifying the consequences for each of the risk scenarios across the organization is an important component of the exercise. Next slide. The next step is identifying the likelihood. And this is where this risk tool is significantly different than any tool that exists internationally. And the key component is the estimating the likelihood is a function of the likelihood of the entire risk scenario, including the risks, likelihood of the risk source occurring and all the orders of impact occurring. It is not just the likelihood of the risk source occurring. An example of this is everybody knows about the Finch culvert failure. If I was to use the likelihood of the flooding or the rain event and the culvert failing, I would get basically a risk associated with that as being low to medium. But if I take into consideration the risk scenario where there is accumulation of debris in the culvert and the lack of inspection and the lack of removal of the debris, which is ultimately what caused the failure of that culvert, then the risk associated with that is extreme. Next slide. Next, we see the calculated risk rating, which is like uh, risk ratings calculate consequence severity times likelihood. Next slide. With respect to risk treatment, we identify the high priority risks to be addressed through a new and modified controls and reassess the residual risk. Next slide. Within transportation, we looked at seven different risk sources. We took, looked at three different functional gr groups within the division, uh, roads, bridges, traffic control signals, business continuity plan, winter maintenance, patrolling, inspections, et cetera. We undertook 90 high priority assets and services. We generated 1,600 risk scenarios for each of the two time periods, 2010 to 2020, 2040 to 2050. We trained 14 risk assessors. We undertook 15 half day risk assessment as well as three day risk treatment. We identified 100 future controls and documented 60 current controls. And most importantly, we established the right mindset within the organization. Next slide is a, uh, shows basically a high-level uh, summary. 
of the uh, risk assessment. And as we can see, that in 2010-2020, most of the risk is in the low to moderate. When we go to the next time period, we see an increase of uh, and frequency of extreme weather events resulting in a quadrupling of extreme risk and doubling of high risk. Next slide. Now, the devil is always in the details. So now we're looking at traffic control signal controllers, the cabinets that where all the uh, communication for the traffic signal uh, reside. And this is an exposure to extreme heat. Now, the controllers uh, have heaters and cooling fans. So the fans turn on at 35 Celsius, and the heaters turn on on 1 Celsius with a max a range of 70 Celsius to uh, minus 35 Celsius. So we would say that that is a control measure. But we also identified specific proposed controls. So we need to monitor the use of these heaters and cooling fans and see if the frequency of use is increasing. We need to do routine inspections. What we found out through the risk assessment, even though we had these control measures, we weren't inspecting them as part of our routine inspection. So if there's a failure of the heater and or the fan, we wouldn't have known about that. So what the red line indicates, the stuff above the line is controls that we could implement within current operating and capital budgets. And things below the red line are things that we need to uh, increase uh, any one of those budgets. An example of that is uninterrupted power supplies to critical intersections for emergency routes. Next slide. The quick summary of the work that was undertaken, we select events, assets, and services. We identify roles, responsibilities, interdependencies. We assess the impact. We develop a strategy for prioritization, an action plan, as well as a communication plan. One of the things, next slide, please is uh, just a quick summary of benefits. Two key benefits I'm going to highlight in, uh, in terms of time here is operationalizing climate change by reviewing enhancing management structures and best practices in operation and maintenance. And to assist in the development of an adaptation strategy, we should include the prioritization of adaptation actions based on climate change risk and cost-benefit analysis. Next slide, please. The lessons learned is in terms of identifying not only lead risk assessors, uh, having a top-down, uh, bottom-up uh, approach, establishing a policy foundation for this body of work, and identifying the uh, synergistic risk. One of the things that we need to understand is that the uh, each of the functional groups need to have uh, be trained in terms of the risk assessment. And each of these people involved have to have a high level of expertise and many years of experience either managing the assets or delivering the services. Next slide. Before I sign off, I want to um, uh, bring your attention to um, a body of work that we have under, undertaking with the Transportation Association of Canada. Envir the Environment Council of TAC has identified a new project that would facilitate the enhancement of the City of Toronto tool and um, move it and standardize it and make it available across Canada. I've included the, the hyperlink for the risk analysis and responding to climate change project. That's the title of it. The value of the project is about $250,000. And currently, the municipalities in the surrounding area of Toronto have uh, pledged $60,000. So I encourage you to take a look at this project. And hopefully, you will be able to uh, fund. And one of the key objectives is this is to enhance the front end of the tool provide additional information on the process, how to undertake this type of exercise. And on the back end is to provide uh, reporting templates and uh, graphical, uh, I'm sorry, uh, graphics in terms of 
performing the analysis uh, and showcasing what the uh, current risk for that organization. Thank you very much. If there are any questions for myself and David. Thank you, Vesna and David. I'm sorry to rush you through a tremendous amount of information that's uh, very valuable. Um, we are uh, at noon, so I do want to just remind everybody that our next webinar is February 25th. Um, so please uh, register online. Uh, for those of you who do have to drop off the line, uh, feel free to do so. But if there are a couple of questions, I think we can just take a few minutes if uh, uh, David and Vesna are willing to stay on the line. Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. If there are any questions. Would be the people have to uh, drop off the line. Um, Laura, are you seeing any questions at all? I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Okay. So please remember, everybody, that uh, all these materials are going to be on our website, as well as uh, contact details if you do want to contact David and Vesna or myself. Um, and I do want to thank you, Vesna and David, for taking the time to go through the uh, really important work that you're doing in Toronto. I think it is quite um, precedent setting for other municipalities to see what you've been able to do and the way that you've been doing it. So congratulations on your progress to date, and I'm sure everybody will be following uh, what your next steps are. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. And please uh, register for our February 25th webinar. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.